1998, I came over to my friend and my, met my future husband just by accident. It turned out that after serving in the army, he was sent to police school for training. We had a wedding in the summer of 98, and in 99 our daughter was born. I met my future husband when I was third year student. We dated for nine months and then decided to get married. He was a soldier. He served in Crimea, in Fedorovka and in Balaklava. He had been a sailor before that and then remained in the army. We had feelings for each other from day one. We didn't date long. We met in July 2006 and moved in together at the end of autumn. Our son was born, which made us very happy, although it did not matter if it was a girl or a boy. A child is a child. My parents were in the military during the Soviet Union times. In 1986, they both died in Afghanistan. Grandpa and Grandma took care of me, and then they sent me to the Suvorov military school, as what's still called back then. When I finished school, where was I supposed to go? The army was the only option. I enlisted and served on a contract for 12 years. Initially, I spent quite some time on peacekeeping missions, also Iraq, Afghanistan, and spent several years in Africa. I withdraw in 2013. When Maidan started, I was in Ukraine. I took part in it from day one. They said, Andriucha, come. They won't do this on their own. They walk in groups, hang around. They don't know what to do. I went there and it was this huge tent. We organized field cooking, heating, food, and so on with the guys. Then on the night of November 30, when Berkut struck, these students got a whipping. And I got beat up too. On February 18th, I took a bullet in Maidan, another one, so to speak, because I had already been injured during an area mission. I took a bullet in Maidan and was taken to hospital in Kiev. They operated on me. It was on the 18th at night. And on February 21st, Poland sent a military medical pain for me and 14 or 15 other people. And they brought us to Krakow, to the military hospital on Wroclawska Street. And that's where they treated us. They saved our lives. Literally. My right hand is paralyzed because the nerves in my spine got damaged, so the hand is, well, almost completely paralyzed. It came to us such an unexpected, let's call it war, although it's not a war, but for us it's war. Mm 
была у нас такая ярая. We had such a strong patriotic idea that we should, that my husband should go, that it would all end soon because there is no other way we have to defend our borders. Мы защитим свои кордоны. It was March, the mobilization was on the 17th. We literally spent a few months shopping, dressing and showing them for the army, as if for school for the first grade. They had to bring everything on their own. This whole war broke out. He was about to leave the army at the end of February. And then this idea, all that, he stayed. And that's how he ended up fighting in this war. At that time, one would still go voluntarily, no official draft. He came home, said, I will go. Of course, I didn't let him go because the baby was two months old. And where to? He said, it's not for a long time, for a few days, just training and then back home. I went to the front as a volunteer, to my crew, to the unit in which I had previously served, to the 8th Regiment. They sent us to Donbass. We are not grouped there. Where they were scattered across different sectors. I remember it was already 10 p.m. Someone comes out of the car. Well, actually, flowers come out first, and then a man. Turned out it was them because my husband asked for 10-day permit as a birthday gift for me. They had not told me before to make it a surprise. The first time he enlisted, I sat for a week and cried my eyes out. I didn't know what was going on. When he came back on a pass and then left, it got easier, but there was stress anyway. We had a problem. We had wanted a baby for a long time, but couldn't conceive. In 2013, the child was finally born, our baby boy. And when my husband came back home once every six months, the child simply did not know him because he was still tiny and did not recognize him. And Seroja would then get hysterical, like, what's going on? The kid doesn't recognize me. Many people who have no war experience think that when a man fights in a war, he fights all day. He fights non-stop, 24 hours a day. No, that's not true. You work 90% of the time. You dig, bury, unload, load, carry something, build something, smash something, do something else, and so on, and so on, and so on. You spend 5% of your time on watch. You spend 5% of your time on watch, doing different security things, and you fight only 5% of the time. The last time he was leaving, I was strangely calm. I didn't even cry, well, he's going, he'll be away for a month, he'll come back and that's it, and he'll be home. I said goodbye to him in peace of mind. In the morning sharp, there is a call. They say we are going to the ATO zone, you should be there. Forget a 10-day pass. 
Not even a day was offered. It was literally only a few hours. In the evening, a car was going from Novogrod and he left. It was July 10th. His friends, when he came back and they got together, they would tell him, get away from there, your contract is over. But he replied, first, they won't let me go, and second, how can I give up on my people? The friends would say, what do you mean give up on them? There will be a replacement, but he would say, no, I can't. If I had to answer today, will I go to war or not, I would say, of course I'll go. I would never change that, because what kind of a Ukrainian would I be? After all, I love Ukraine. I love my country very much. For me, words such as the national banner, anthem, Ukraine's national emblem are not empty words. Just like Ukraine's independence is not an empty word. Well, how could we just bow to the mask of it? Not in a lifetime. Never. It was in August that this whole thing with Ivovaisk began. It was then that we are pushing nicely forward and it was decided to surround Donetsk from both sides and seize Ivovaisk, which happened to lie on the route from Russia. They wanted to close this road to cut through the Russia channel of supply of weapons, ammunition and mercenaries for all these sephars. My husband never said where he was, what he was doing, and that he was on his way to the ATO zone. His commander, the commander of the brigade, wanted him on his detail, even though he was a scout. Even today, I still don't understand why they need bodyguards in the army when you have four and a half thousand armed men around you. I do not understand. It is still beyond me today. Meanwhile, at our headquarters level, so to speak, 
they got lightheaded from all the success. And they messed up a bit. And the enemy hit from the sides and cut us off. I am calling. It was actually our penultimate phone call. They had just arrived at the dislocation site. It was the Panivka, the Donetsk region, Shakhtar district. They are kind of breathless. I say, Yura, where are you going? What happened? And he says, I am going because there is nobody to fight and there is nothing to fight with. And that's when it began. That's when for the first time the Russians started to attack openly with their armed forces. Unfortunately, on the turn of August 12th and 13th, my husband became one of the first who came into live contact with our neighbors, with the Russians, brutes, because there is no way I call them brothers. And so it happened that we found ourselves surrounded and supposedly some kind of talk began in which the Russians promised to release us. Then when they were leaving Iwovaisk, when the four of them climbed down from some tower, my husband called me and said, I don't know whether to say goodbye or not, I'm on the run, just don't tell mom. I run, he says, they shoot, he says, they're just the four of us, everybody has left us. There, when the Grats hit, the boys were in the column, and not only the Grats, because there was artillery fire too, which, God forbid, hit them hard. Well, of course, we also hit the mask of its back. But it was not that one side prevailed, but it was a disaster. And the people were a bit shocked. Many were injured. In our group, we carried them in our arms, because abandoning them was not an option. Then one wife called, also a widow, her husband, Bogdan Sachnik, used to drive with Yura as a driver. And she says, you know, our boys faced heavy fire, there was a tough fight.
Well, they died there, and our groups also had losses. I took a shrapnel in my leg. I tied it up with something and somehow hobbled back. That he had been injured that I knew, but the way he told me about this, his was a totally different story. I didn't know that it had been Ivo Weisk. To be honest, we did not take the dead away, because we had to keep our strength to save the injured. We only buried them, but only just because we did everything on the run, in a hurry, fast, fast. Nearly 400 of our people died then. And then one of the greatest life traumas hit me. The phone ringing, people asking about Yura. His brother calls me, he's also a soldier, and says, I can't reach him. And that was half past midnight. He is asleep at this time. He says, no, they called from the headquarters and said he had been killed. I say, it can't be. They called to say that a bad thing had happened. They said he had died. At first I thought it was somehow not true, that maybe he was injured or something. They said no, that is certain. It's such a cliché, a very simple answer, death. Not in the sense of death as such, but in the experience of your mates dying. The hardest part is death. This is the heaviest. On August 14th, I was at work. There was a call, but no one answered. I didn't know where to go, who to turn to. I didn't know anyone. I tried everything. Clairvoyants, fortune tellers. Everyone said that he was alive and would come back on his birthday. Just wait. We waited. Well, it was hard, especially for those who survived. Many of our people were taken captive there, so well, it was hard. All of that was hard. I dashed online, I found the headquarters, I'm calling, they don't know anything, they say, we'll find out. I asked them to tell me, those who were near half a kilometer away in position, they say, we don't know what to say, how to explain this to you? Not everything can be described to people. Why? Because not all die in the war, the way we imagine they do or the way we want them to.
They gave me some phone numbers, I called the commander half day next day, and he, the commander of the 72nd Brigade, he's not been briefed, he says, I don't know, I'm in Kyiv. I can shake the feeling that to him, the man, there is more like a dog than a human. Even though it's been a year now, you'd like them to say something, and then you think maybe it's better not to know, because maybe it would be harder if you knew what it was really like. No. Well, for example, you will not tell someone that their husband died like a fool, that he stepped onto a mine hidden in the bush, even though there was a warning sign there. Well, he died a hero, having wiped out loads of Russians. That goes without saying. A message from the investigating officer on February 18th, on my husband's birthday. He calls me, I would like to invite you. Oh, you look at the photo and you don't believe it. You begin to understand that it really happened, that it's all true. And when we arrived at the investigating officers, he took out the stuff. He opened the bag with the stuff. Alas, this was our stuff. We left with this information. We called the local MP station in Zhitomer. And they sent a car with a zinc coffin to fetch a body. Obviously, we did go to funerals. We did go. It was such a tough moment. You look them in the eye and you see the question, why him and not you? Why you came to fetch him and not the other way around? It was such a shock. I thought that I would not be able to survive something like this. But it turns out that we are ready even for something like that. I was so sure about how I have to. I don't have to do anything. No one needs my pain, no one needs my suffering. I have to endure it all by myself, suffer. But you don't understand why? What are all these deaths for? They say that time heals. It does not heal. Time does not heal anything like that. It can never be forgotten. Now I'm all alone. Two kids. The older, a girl, is at the university. The boy is already in second grade. He keeps asking. It is difficult for him without his dad. Both the older and the younger keep asking, remembering the happy moments.
це треба, це... You have to. This Remembrance Day has to be celebrated. Якщо ми не пам'ятаємо своїх героїв, то... Because if we don't remember our heroes... То ми не маємо майбутнього. Then we don't have a future. But it's a very hard thing. Це дуже тяжка річ. Все. I can't listen to this song. It makes me cry. None of us can listen to it without shedding tears. Плине кача по тисі. 